Hey everyone, I am back and today we're going to be talking about chapter 5 of the My Lady textbook, which is Infection Control, Principles and Practices. This is one of the most crucial chapters to know, especially if you want to pass your state board written exam. And a lot of the techniques you'll be demonstrating in your state board practical is going to be based off of this chapter. The examiners want to ensure that you're using safe practice. You're ensuring the safety of yourself and your client and you're being mindful to sanitize. So I do want to start off by saying that I'm going to divide this video into two parts. The first part is going to be the basic principles of infection control. We're going to be talking about some types of infection. And then the second part is going to be about um, pr proper procedure and the types of disinfectants that you might be familiar with or may not know that are in the salon. So make sure you read the um, publisher's note um, in the previous editions of this chapter, the term sanitation, also known as sanitizing, was used interchangeably to mean clean or cleaning. Um, that is changing. The term cleaning is defined as a mechanical process such as scrubbing, using soap and water or detergent, and water to remove all visible dirt, debris, and many disease-causing germs. Cleaning will remove the debris that you see. Now the term sanitize is defined as a chemical process for reducing the number of disease causing germs on clean surfaces to a safe level. The term disinfection is defined as a chemical process that uses specific products to destroy harmful organisms except bacterial spores on environmental surfaces. So know that there's a difference in the terminology. When I say that, um, you know, think of if you have a, an old-fashioned time mom like me, you know that you constantly get yelled at to clean your room. Well, if they say clean your room, that doesn't mean we're going to go in there with chemicals and throw chemicals everywhere. No, it means that we're going to go in there, we're going to vacuum, we're going to pick up the clothes off the floor, um, organize the bookshelf, we're moving things around, getting the dust off. Then if we have to, to what is it, disinfect um, a surface, like let's say in our room we spill, um, you know, grape soda on the floor. Well, we have to go in there, we have to first use a paper towel, mop it up, and then we're going to go over there with the cleaning thing to make sure we didn't leave any stains. Those kind of principles are always at play in the salon, whether we think they are or not, sometimes we're not conscious of them. Um, even just day-to-day -day basic um, hygiene, you know, we clean our house, our, hopefully our house is clean, we vacuum, we do all that. Um, it's important to know what agents are using as well, and we're going to talk about those later. I do also want to do a little activity for you guys real quick. I want you all to close your eyes and in the first scenario, it's like meditation, think about going inside a salon. What do you see? What do you smell? Does the salon smell clean? Does it look clean? You know, you're hopefully being greeted properly. You should be going down there and seeing everything is shiny and new and fresh. Um, maybe you're offered food. The food is prepared in a sanitary manner. The station you're sitting at is fresh and clean. There's no hair all over the floor. You're not sitting in someone else's mess. Now, on the flip side, think about going into a salon that's very dingy. What are you smelling? Are you smelling something like, you know, anchovies or does it smell really gross? Are you putting your feet in a pedicure bath that looks like it has debris in there, it smells bad? Are you sitting down at a hairdresser station where there's crumbs and food everywhere and maybe you saw a cockroach? No, it sounds pretty gross, but there's actually salons out there. And I'll tell you my own personal experience, way before I was a professional, and I always knew I loved hair and the beauty thing, um, I wanted to go and get my hair um, colored professionally. And I was at that time doing like a higher level, so I was doing about like a like a light brown, dark blonde. I went in there and the salon um, said, oh yeah, we'll do it. It was very cheap, and that was one of the first um, red flags. I get sit down on I get sat down in a chair and if you guys can imagine this the entire salon looked like it was stuck in the 80s and not that it's a bad thing but it was really dingy too the chairs um, had tape on them I think they had like Bessa bricks on one of the or concrete bricks as you call them on one of the carts it was pretty broken down it was actually what you guys call ratchet and then the shampoo sink was this old-fashioned chair that it looked like it'd been through the ringer it had duct tape on the handle that was like kind of loose and then the back of the seat had like a hole the manager, she applied my color. She decides to go and leave to go eat. So I'm sitting there. The salon smelled really dingy in the back too. It smelled kind of like musty newspaper smell. The color was on my head too long and it turned very drab. I then go over to her station. Her station had dust on it. It was all messy. There was color stains all over the place. She had crumbs and um, products that were half empty and it was just a dump. And I saw that and I was like, oh, I did not go back there. Not only because um, the service wasn't good, but also because it was pretty dingy and I didn't really trust the service, even if they offered to fix it. So know that your reputation as a stylist and a salon is always at stake if you're not practicing proper um, etiquette and cleanliness procedures. 
be familiar that there are different federal agencies. These agencies ensure that we're doing our job. One of them um, is OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This is part of the U.S. Department of Labor. Know that you have every right to have access to the MSDS, which is the Material Safety Data Sheet. This is mandatory for all products being sold. It tells you what the risks are, um, what kind of hazards are with this product, and it might even talk about how to use them. Um, there's also the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. They have a whole list of um, disinfectants, such as tuberculocidal disinfectants, meaning it kills tuberculosis. Know this, the, ho the term hospital grade is not a term used by the EPA. The EPA does not grade disinfectants, a product that is either approved by the EPA as a hospital disinfectant or not. So basically, um, the, the term hospital grade isn't always a necessity. You can have really other uh, powerful disinfectants. I know the book kind of words it wrong. Just be aware of that, that everything being sold may not um, be you know, as marketable or live up to the claim. So know that um, with the hospital grade disinfectants, they're effective for cleaning blood and body, body fluids. They can be used on any non-porous surface in the salon, meaning that if something is non-porous, it's not gonna penetrate. Something that's porous is like concrete, brick, it has little holes in it, even though we don't see them, and any kind of solution can go in there. Think about if you pour water on a brick, over time it breaks, because there's cracks in the brick and holes in the brick. A non-porous surface is like granite or um, something that has a seal on it that fluids can't pass through. So hospital disinfectants control the spread of disease, an abnormal condition of all parts of the body or systems that make the body incapable of homeostasis. So tuberculocidal disinfectants, those are the types that kill tuberculosis. It's transmitted um, through long-term airborne contact. And know that TB um, it makes spores that are very tough to kill and that's why it is such an issue. Know this, the fact that tuberculocidal disinfectants are more powerful does not mean you should immediately reach for them. Sometimes you can use a product and it's very harmful to the tool, it can damage the metal, it can also be harmful for the stylist um, as well. And you also want to know the rules on the state and local level because in the salon, some items are allowed in um, certain salons by the state, others are not. Same thing with disinfectants. One of the best examples I can give is in New Jersey, um, here in New Jersey we are not allowed to carry Velcro rollers in the salon, even though people do it anyway, because what happens with Velcro rollers is you can't disinfect them. The same with the bore brushes. So know that it is against federal law to use any disinfecting products contrary to its labeling. Um, you want to make sure that if you are a manufacturer, before a manufacturer can sell it, it must obtain an EPA registration number that certifies that the disinfectant may be used. Not following that can be very serious. It can cost you a lot, potentially jail time because you're breaking federal law. So read the Did You Know chapter in this book. I actually think this is really interesting. This talks about um, what can happen when uh, procedures are not followed for disinfectation. Not, oh, I'm sorry, disinfection. I am making up words today. <laughs> so it gives the example of mycobacterium Fordium. And before I did cosmetology, I actually was studying a pre-med program, a bio program, and I know that the mycobacterium, so these really weird bacteria, you might know um, one of the most famous ones is leprosy, if you know what that is, it has awful sores. These bacteria are really weird in that they're not as well understood and there's still some um, more to learn about their pathology. A lot of them are thought to be not as um, dangerous, but in this case, this one type of species caused a massive outbreak in 2000. Over 100 clients from just one California salon had skin lesions all over their legs, and some of it spread and it left scarring. This isn't good because we didn't know this, that this bacteria was that pathogenic before, it was otherwise thought of as benign, and that was due to improper cleaning of the pedicure tub. So know that um, you can accidentally cause that one outbreak that you're not even sure that this pathogen exists. You do not want to have that salon um, reputation. Know that state regulatory agencies, these are agencies like that local health department, um, welfare agencies, licensing agencies, these all enforce the rules of the state locally and they also try to bring in some of the federal laws too. You want to understand um, be, that what the laws are because they can issue fines such as penalties. The penalties can be fines, warnings, probation, suspension, and in the worst case scenario, revocation of license, meaning that you're not allowed to practice in that one state. 
and that could hurt your chances of getting licensed in another state. Known someone that happened to. It can also cost your salon. Your salon can get shut down. If you're the owner, you can lose your business. Know that your reputation can be ruined. Your license and everyone's safety can also be compromised. So if you're that one stylist that maybe causes a disease outbreak from not cleaning um, you know, your razor, if you're using the same razor, you're spreading hepatitis or HIV, you're gonna be known as that one stylist and you could potentially face jail time. People are gonna ridicule you online. You'll never have that same reputation again. Especially if you're from a small town, that's you're gonna be out of luck there. So know the difference between laws and rules. Laws are written by both federal and state legislations that determine the scope of practice, what you're allowed to do with your license. For example, with my license, cosmetology, I'm not allowed to um, perform a deep peel using phenol acid. I am not allowed to do surgery on someone, obviously. Um, that is what is there. Laws are also called statutes, and laws, like the state law, if there's a statute, I'm making this up, statute four, which states that um, a salon um, must have um, X amount of space in order to be efficient, that's one um, statute. Cosmetologists must be aware of local laws. This is why I always do assignments, right? Have you go on there and read the local laws. Know this word too, here's an important word that may not be in the book, ancillary service. Every state has ancillary services. These are services that are beyond the scope of our license. One of the best examples I can think of is teeth whitening. When I go to the IBS beauty show in New York, they do teeth whitening there and they have all kinds of services that would otherwise be considered ancillary in New Jersey. We're not allowed to do that. This is an important FYI on this side. Salon professionals are not allowed to treat or recommend treatments for infections, diseases, or abnormal conditions. Clients with such problems to be referred to their physician. So for example, I can't come have a client sit in my chair and I'll look at them and I say, oh, that rash right there, you know, that might be um, shingles or, oh, that looks like it might be a very serious infection. You need to have antibiotics. Um, obviously we're not gonna prescribe them, but us saying that, we're not allowed to do that. What I could say though, is if someone comes in and they, let's say they come in there for um, a haircut, so I go to um, shampoo them, or even before that, I go to take a look at their hair, where it's at, and I notice there's a big sore up here that's oozing pus and maybe it smells funny. What I'm gonna say is, um, have you noticed that? And I'll kind of try to figure out like what's going on. They'll say, oh yeah, that's been there, it's been bleeding. Immediately, I know that I'm at risk of a bloodborne pathogen or a communicable disease because there is pus, there's inflammation, that's usually a sign of infection. And what I can tell them legally is um, because you have an open uh, sore, I can't um, work on you today, but if you go to your doctor and you get a note saying you're okay for me to service you, then I can perform the service. That's what's important. And you also have to be careful with trusting clients because sometimes a rash that may not look bad, even though it's oozing, they'll say, oh, it's nothing, but it can be something serious. You also um, want to be careful because if you someone comes and asks, oh, what's this mark? Is this um, abnormal? You don't want to say, oh yeah, that, that's probably cancer because what could happen there is you're going to cause them false fear and there have been cases where people can actually get sued. Um, they can sue your stylist or esthetician because you put them through that much fear or, um, you know, stress. What you could do is say, what you could say to them is, hmm, that looks a little interesting. Have you gotten that checked out? And then what they'll do is they'll go there, they'll go to the doctor and hopefully it'll be fine. Um, so little things like that, make sure you're um, being careful about that. I know as young students, we do want to like help everyone and there's a way to do it. And if you're not careful, it can, you can have good intentions, but the result won't be good. Know um, the principles of infection, that when you're in the salon, you also could be at risk of infection. An infection is the invasion of body tissues by disease causing pathogens. If your actions result in injury and infection, you could lose your license or ruin the salon's reputation. Um, that's why it's important to practice infection control. Know that there's different types of infection, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. I had one of my students ask me, this is really funny. They go, oh, but what about mad cow disease? And I started laughing like, you know, that's not gonna be really a risk in the salon. Um, but basically mad cow disease, that's actually, just as a fun little side note, that's called a prion. It's a protein gone rogue. And basically there is nothing you can do to kill it because it's not living, just like viruses aren't living. Um, but that's not a risk in the salon. So if you guys are worried about mad cow disease, not an issue in your salon. Um, know that under certain conditions, a lot of organisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites can cause an infectious disease. Infectious disease is, a, is caused by a pathogen, harmful organism that enter the body. It may or may not spread from one person to another. Know that infection control are methods used to eliminate or reduce the transmission of infection organisms. 
We know that cleaning is a mechanical process, such as scrubbing, using soap and water to remove all the visible dirt. The process of disinfection destroys most, but not necessarily all of the harmful organisms on surfaces. Disinfection is not effective against bacterial spores. So for example, one of the best examples I can give with this is hand sanitizer. I had done a microbiology lab experiment where I tested hand sanitizer, I'd swab my hands and swab one of the auger plates, and I found that hands that had um, hand sanitizer, they showed very little signs of bacteria, but you'd see a lot of spores. That's why it's really good to have both practices go together. First, you're gonna do your manual cleaning, such as your scrubbing, your dusting, your washing, soap and water, clean everything off, and then you put your chemical disinfectant on it. Know that bleach, um, one of the best disinfectants that we can use, is not gonna be as effective if we don't first get all the visible debris off, because the debris is gonna lower the potency. So spores, um, that's an issue. You need to use a special disinfectant for that. That's why when we wash our hands with the soap and water, just putting soap on your hands won't kill the bacteria. We need to use warm water and wash. Doing that will cleanse everything off. It will de-germ it. Cleaning and disinfecting procedures are designed to prevent the spread of infection and disease. Disinfectants used in the salon must be bactericidal, capable of destroying bacteria. Virucidal, capable of destroying viruses. Fungicidal, capable of destroying fungi. Make sure you're being aware of how to mix them. Some infections um, that are bacterial or even um, viral, they may not jump as readily. So for example, if we're servicing a client who's on, who has HIV um, and they're on medication, that's not gonna spread readily through the salon from a hair coloring service or uh, putting in um, a wig or hair extensions. It may be a risk um, even though they're on medication because we always wanna be safe and think the worst case scenario if there is a cut or a blood spill accident. So take a look at the bacteria chart. Um, bacteria, singular bacterium, these are microorganisms that have both plant and animal characteristics. Know that a microorganism is any organism of microscopic size. We can't see a bacteria with our naked eye. Um, otherwise, that would be pretty scary if we can actually see them everywhere. Um, no, you need a microscope to see them. So know that there are different types of bacteria. There's non-pathogenic. They're not capable of causing disease in humans. They usually are very beneficial, such as the ones that make yogurt, wine, um, certain types of medications, such as penicillin, those actually help uh, kill other bacteria. No, no, sorry, not bacteria. It's fungi that make penicillin. Been a long day. Um, but they do, they're used for um, insulin, that's what I meant to say. Uh, they use special technology and the bacteria make insulin. That's a good example of um, non-pathogenic bacteria helping us. Know that pathogenic is what we don't want. These are harmful microorganisms, such as the bacteria that causes acne, um, whooping cough, pneumonia. And know that bacteria, they're classified by their size. Size and shape of bacteria can help you know a lot of things, such as what it uh, causes, its functions, all of that. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna stop this here, and then I'm gonna make a second part talking about some of the types of bacteria. I know it's getting a little bit long. I don't want you guys to get like overwhelmed with all this. So take a break, um, have a cup of coffee, a snack, and I'll be right back to continue this.